Welcome to everybody. It is a treat to be with all of you today and I'm very looking forward to engaging you all on my uh, love uh, and my first joy of, of, of wine and food, which is of course the uh, understanding of the what, why and how, what works together, why they go together. I think it's important before we get started just to um, reiterate the obvious, which is to say that, that, that wine of course is a very personal experience and we know what we like and we don't you know what we don't like. Uh, wine and, and food are even more um, particular and personal because of course people have very strong opinions about food, about what they like. Um, they've enjoyed these since they were little babies when we all knew to uh, eat the bananas and spit out the green uh, peas and um, has only galvanized itself moving forward. So needless to say, when you put the two of them together, it becomes exponentially personal. So my goal, primary objective today is not really one of telling you what to do and how to do it, which is frankly too prescriptive, rigid, and um, unfair, but really one to sort of um, evoke your brain a little bit, try and get into your mouth and help you understand what's going on there so that you can make uh, good decisions on your own. Again, not prescriptive, simply providing guidelines. So that stated, Let's go ahead and um, take a look at this. And I refer to this a bit like a crack in the code, if you will, sort of a so-called Rosetta Stone or Babel, if you will, in the new world. So it's important to note that depending on what angle you're coming from, things will differ a little bit. So if you're um, looking at it from the wine's point of view first, many of us know that this is really gonna be the case of life. If you're a sommelier and you're doing a winemaker dinner, you're always gonna be focused on the wine first and then working back with your chef uh, to, to put together uh, pairings that work well. So when you speak with your guests and the attendees, they'll really have a, a positive experience. The second is gonna be um, when either you have pulled, if in a dining room for, for a guest, or um, just have ordered if you're going to a restaurant uh, or going to your own cellar, a special bottle of wine, which you want to highlight, then obviously the honest is really gonna be on the wine first, as that's the star of the show, and then trying to pick the foods that go around it. And then finally, like many of you, um, out there. You're probably just a wine obsessed individual and everything goes wine first, food second, wine first, everything second. So if in fact that's the case, obviously having the wine drive and understanding the um, uh, rules around that or the guidelines around that is going to be hypercritical. But not everybody is like that. And I would suggest to you that Joe and Mary, Joao and Maria, uh, Jean and Marie uh, are all going to be food first people. The average consumer thinks first about what they're going to eat and then about what they're going to drink. And now, if, again, if you sort of look at that in a practical context, this could be looked at in a number of ways. First of all, again, you're a sommelier, you're working on the floor and your, uh, your guest looks at you and saying, I'm having XYZ dish, uh, so what wine should I have? Um, or, um, you know, that's just sort of their, their focal point. They're going to want to pick their food first and their wine second. Secondarily, if you're an invited guest at somebody's house and they tell you what they're cooking or making and are asking you uh, to bring the wine to, to accompany it, well, that's the secondary thing. And by the same token, that could be you. You simply have pulled out a cookbook or uh, the you know copy of a magazine for this month and you've identified a recipe that you wanna make. And needless to say, the food is going to drive. So both of those cases are examples of a food first wine second person. And then there are a number of people um, who are just simply um, food obsessed. I know it's um, hard to imagine that any would be more food obsessed than they are wine obsessed, but take it from me. You've all got friends. I've got friends and they think food first, wine second. But here's the big thing before we get started. The reality is that whether it's wine or food, only one of the two can be the number one. Only one of the two can be the lead. And I want to think about uh, you to think about this in the context of something that has very little to do with wine and food, and that is, in fact, dancing. Now, if you are uh, an avid dancer, and I know um, <laughs> my wife wished I was more of an avid dancer, um, you know that in certain types of dancing, uh, specifically waltzing or tangoing, somebody needs to lead and somebody needs to follow. If the one person who is leading 
has another person who is also thinking they're leading, you're going to step on each other, you could fall down, it could be a, a, it could be a disastrous um, encounter. But you also know that when you're waltzing, you know, you move around and there's sort of a, just a sense of following and leading. And in tangoing, if you've ever had the pleasure of, of doing this amazing dance or being down in Buenos Aires, where they do a lot of it, you'll note that there's obviously a choreography to it. And literally, as uh, the lead has their hand on your back, it is their movements of their hand and how and where they place that hand that actually is the guide to where the next person dancing with them should move to. So one leads, one follows. One is the best or lead supporting actor or actress. One is the best supporting lead, uh, best supporting actor or actress. And I hope that makes sense to you. That all said, let's jump into the next element of this. Complicated that it used to be. That's made where it used to be a little bit more uh, complicated than it used to be in the sense that um, today food is very different than it used to be, which is to say we're faced with um, non-classic foods. The first is what I like to refer to as conflation cuisines. And this is probably evident regardless of where you are, that cultures are coming together. Um, in America, we say that's because of our whole melting pot of uh, immigration and things like that over time, cultures moving together in the world of food. And then as chefs travel, as all of us travel, we pick up influences and push them together. So whether you call it, you know, Salvadorian sous vide or Mexicorean or lamb hero mole tacos or rasta pasta or whatever it is, we are seeing these things where two cultures that may not share a lot in common on face value on the surface have actually come together with cuisines. And I remember when, um, Roy Choi started with the first ever bull colgi tacos and burritos in California. That was literally an earthquake in terms of how things happen together. So we're dealing with that. And obviously cultures um, don't necessarily have wine in mind when they think about that in that manner. The second thing is we've seen these sort of dis deconstruction cuisine, these disruption cuisines, which are um, you know, made probably most evident by classic um, four-star gastronomy around the world, whether it was El Bouilly, whether it's Alinea in Chicago, et cetera, places that sort of really take food and completely invert it, turn it on your head. So whether you're ordering inverted nachos, granulated hamburgers, thinking about a dish as simple in our mind's eye as fish and chips, but you know, sous vide the fish, topping it with quinoa puffs to add crunch, no grease, um, using uh, potato chips made from sweet potatoes rather than classic chip chips, in-house sauces with vinegar, sriracha, et cetera. All of these things kind of re make us rethink. So the old rules of wine and food, which oftentimes go based on from the wine side, color coding, red wine with meat, white wine with fish, pink wine with poultry, when in doubt, drink beer, um, to also foods that we sort of looked at very traditionally as sort of staying in their lanes with respect to where they are. But what we're seeing is more and more uh, culinary cars, if you will, veering in and out of the lanes and making it increasingly complicated for everybody. So I always tell people that as I kind of alluded to earlier, wine and food are sort of like learning foreign language. So when we're young and we're learning foreign languages and I'm blessed to be able to speak three, um, you know, we all know that you sort of take something, listen to it, translate it in your head into your native language, think about what you want to see, translate it back. And we're constantly doing this and that until you hit that moment where you literally start thinking and reflexively answering in the language, which at, point, at which point in time you're quote unquote thinking in the language. And that's a lot easier to do um, when you're younger, because when you're younger, you know, you're going to make mistakes inevitably, uh, wrong verb, wrong adjective, wrong adverb, whatever. And as we get older, we're more fearful about embarrassing ourselves by making these mistakes. This is why kids can speak five languages and keep them all in their head when they're little, because they're not a upset or worried about making mistakes. They're just sort of working the brain things out there. And um, they're used to adults critiquing them all the time anyway. So it's pretty easy for them. As we get older, it becomes difficult. The second thing is, um, so you need to get past difficulty and push through that. The second thing is, is that historically, as I said before, this sort of lane staying has benefited people who come from European and Western cultures because um, we knew where the foods were. French food was French food, Italian food, Italian food, Spanish food, Spanish food, Portuguese, Portuguese food. You had the sort of whatever goes together, grows together mentality there. 
um, coupled with color coding on the things and everything worked out well. And people also didn't overthink it because wine was on the table along with their food, much like their salt, their pepper, their olive oil, their butter, et cetera. So they just kind of inherently were comfortable around it. Whereas cultures that don't necessarily have wine traditionally, America, not that long ago, but many countries in Asia, both North and South, where wine up until recently has not necessarily been grown uh, in all places and, and made there. So the people, particularly younger people, are adapting wine into their uh, culture. Whereas before you were drinking other beverages, uh, distillates, you were drinking uh, baijo and soju and all these other things uh, that didn't necessarily fit into the classic wine boxes. But bottom line is finding your own sweet spot, no pun intended, is gonna be what makes it work and understand that it's subjective, understand that it's personal and understand that it differs for everybody. So before we jump into the things here, I wanna sort of focus on one big aha moment that I had that I'm gonna try and help you have too, which is understanding that wine alone and wine with food are two very different experiences. And most people start thinking about these things um, from a wine solitary thing, but I would tell you that that's a mistake. Why? First of all, um, we all know out there whether who, doesn't matter who you read or whatever, certain wines get lauded, they get big scores, they get 97 points, 100 points, they get big rave reviews, et cetera. Um, and they do not necessarily mean they're going to go well with food. Oftentimes, and I don't know how many of you have ever done it out there, but if you sit down and you're doing a, I don't know, a morning flight of say 100 Chardonnays, um, after you get past the first 10 or 15, there's a sort of monotony that sets in in your brain. And it's only when wines stick out that you start to pay attention and maybe score a little bit higher. Why might that be? Well, in the case of Chardonnay, it might be excessive malolactic fermentation, giving wine that really buttery character. It might be a lot of lees in there and batonage, which are gonna give wine these incredibly creamy texture. It might be a lot of oak, which adds the baking spices and the vanillin and the toast and the, all those other things there that jump out at you and jump out at critics a lot of time and make them score higher. Interestingly enough, what you'll find is that these um, distortions in the typical uh, um, iteration of that wine may not make it wine friendly and for reasons that we're going to learn in a few minutes may make it less food friendly uh, than it would have been otherwise. The second thing we have is food wines and food wines is a, is a phrase that can either be positive or negative depending on where you come from it. Now I've been in the business for uh, literally four decades now and it used to be at the very beginning that when wines were not very good People would oftentimes come and try and sell them to you. And you'd say, oh my God, I can't buy this wine. I really don't like it. And they would say, well, Evan, you know, maybe, maybe bring some food out from the kitchen. This is what we call a food wine. It goes really well with food, which means, and I go, what does that mean? It doesn't taste good by itself. And they go, no, 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 bring some food out. And inevitably, if you brought some food out from the kitchen, oftentimes, again, for reasons we'll explore uh, in a few minutes, the wines went better with food even though they may not provide a lot of, of uh, pleasure uh, principle to you, but nevertheless, they were really delicious uh, with the food. So you'd probably feel sorry for the salesperson, order a few cases and move on. Move on. But um, as I always say, food wines, depending on who you are, I mean, for me, it makes me twitch. Um, not because I'm in the witness protection program, by the way, but just because I've been burned before on wines that I was told were food wines that actually weren't really good. But sometimes food wines are indeed good with food. So if somebody says that to you, just pay attention. And then lastly, and probably the most importantly for your average person out there, is the difference between a great wine and a great wine experience. Now, if we were all lucky enough to have in our glass today, um, I don't know, uh, you know, a, a Batar Montraché from a great vintage or whatever, we would all sit there and talk about it in our white lab coats as we didn't say anything and all agree, ooh, ah, amazing, that this was a great wine. It was worthy of 12 gazillion points and it was incredible, right? Um, and it also would cost an incredible amount of money, which if you ordered it in a restaurant would cost you an incredible amount of money, exponential. So maybe that same great wine it's not going to be a great wine experience in the context of the restaurant because you can't afford it or, you know, whatever. But, you know, it doesn't have to be. And in fact, if you ask most people what their most memorable realities are with respect to wine and food, it is not so much what they were drinking, but it's the situation they were in. It was, you know, hitchhiking across Europe with their uh, significant other at the time, staring into each other's eyes in Siena over a fiasco of God knows what, staring into each other eye, other's eyes and remembering that meal as being theirs. Remember that it's oftentimes emotional value and not so much the realities of uh, the food and wine working together 
which make things work for people. So keep those in mind. So the ways in which food and wine can work together are basically um, four. Um, the first one I would encourage you not to uh, try and replicate, which is the sort of unmitigated disaster, the perfect storm, if you will, of wines and foods not going well together. And this could be that super tannic red wine with a super oily piece of fish, or it could be a super sweet dessert and a bone dry bottle of champagne that you're enjoying at somebody's wedding or something like that. When you push the extremes so opposite or the general corollaries of why they are not going to work together are heightened um, you don't want to do that you don't want to share that with your friends you don't want to do it yourself and more often than not once you do it you never do it again the understanding of why that happened to you is sort of why we're here today but do not replicate unmitigated disaster the second thing i do and you're all probably guilty of this as i am many times is what i call the costa rica factor the switzerland factor which is to say complete neutrality wine's nice food's nice pairing's nice but it doesn't add a lot of value to your life this can be very helpful at, at big events, weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever the big event is, where you're dealing with hundreds of people, all of whose individual palettes you don't know, so you want to play it safe. Um, and those are great, but they will not necessarily inspire uh, you for tastings. The third one is what I call the Ocean's Eleven factor. Um, and if any of you remember Ocean's Eleven, the movie, the remake, not the original, but the remake had Elliot Gould, it had Julia Roberts, Don Cheadle, Brad Pitt, um, you know, our, our great friend, uh, George Clooney. I mean, all these great actors and actresses together. And if you're a fan of any one of them, you're probably following the actor or actress as much as the plot so that you're tr you probably don't remember. I had to see that movie three times before I actually understood it. And in the world of wine and food, if you've got all these superstars or people, or in this case, characteristic wines and foods demanding your attention, then it's going to be hard to focus on the match. And when everyone's fighting for attention, we know that that's generally a lose-lose for everybody. So you don't want to do that one. You don't want to do the unmitigated disaster. You really want to find a sweet spot that's not safe, but that's not overly daring, because oftentimes those will equal epiphany. Now, one plus one equals three. When you have that food, that wine, and your jaw drops after you've swallowed, of course, because you've had the most amazing experience you've ever had in your life, that's great. Um, but you can't recreate it. You literally have to enjoy the moment because even if you take the same wine, the same food, the same people in the same place, um, it's not the same time. The moment has passed. You've already experienced it once. So I would tell you all not to aspire to epiphany because you cannot recreate epiphany. Enjoy it when it happens, let it roll, note the moment, but move on. Um, and then if it does happen by accident, as we're strategizing, all the more power to you. So there are five keys to wine that we're going to talk about here. The first two are...